Thanks for joining me for this interview with Dr. James Cooper. I have segmented this interview, I have indexed this interview down in the description into specific questions and topics that I'm asking Dr. Cooper. So if you don't want to watch a one hour interview, you don't have to go through every single minute and pick the information that you want to listen to or that you want to hear about or learn about. Go down in the description, you can read the individual questions, click on the hyperlinked time to fast forward through the movie to that section. I've also included contact information for Dr. Cooper as well as links in the description where you can find more information on GMOs, biotechnology, and anything that we spoke about today. Leave your comments and questions below. Again, thank you for watching. Dr. James Cooper is a retired PhD chemist and computer scientist. He's written thousands, thousands, thousands of articles and blog posts, many having to do with the topic of uh, GMOs, biotechnology, food safety, as well as many books, the most recent having to do with Food Myths Debunked, or the title was Food, De food Myths Debunked. And uh, there you go. And, and I'm glad you're holding that up because I forgot my copy because I'm now in the office. So thank you for holding that up, Food Myths Debunked. Um, Dr. Cooper, welcome. Thanks for uh, having a chance to talk with you. Uh, you've been writing for The Examiner for the past five years or so. What motivated you to write about this broad topic of that, that entails GMOs, food safety, biotechnology, and food myths? Well, uh, when I started getting the idea of writing for Examiner, I originally thought I was going to be writing about food, recipes, restaurants, and so forth. And I did for a while, but it turned out many, many other people were treading that same ground. Mm -hmm. And I, but I realized what I really wanted to write about was the science behind it. I went back and looked at my early columns, and by the third or fourth one, I was already writing about science. I think I had two columns on sugars and what they actually were, mm -hmm. and then artificial sweeteners and HFCS and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of started to take me in a slightly different direction. Uh, it came, uh, but it was really about that sort of food chemistry until I started seeing all of this discussion of uh, biotechnology, genetically modified crops, and so forth. And at first, I sort of was taken in by what people were saying, but it seemed a little less than credible because it got more and more extreme and less and less believable. Mm -hmm. Then I learned about a website called academicsreview.org that seemed to debunk almost all of the myths of the time. Most of them, from a book, they debunked an awful lot of things in a book by Jeffrey Smith. And so I called up Bruce Chassie, who lives in the United States. He and David Tribe, who lives in Australia, put this together and asked them, um, asked him a lot of questions to get me started on understanding more about why he did it and how, and basically he got me started understanding what biotechnology really was and why people needn't be worried about it because it was just a way of breeding plants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that brings me, uh, I'm going to skip a few, one, two, skip a few questions here and, and sort of go with, so you've, over the last five or six years, ever since meeting Bruce, uh, your stance sort of before you got into involved in all this biotechnology was sort of anti-GMO, where you didn't really believe in them, let's say, but, but that opinion changed. Can you kind of take us through how your opinion changed of, uh, regarding biotechnology and GMO? Well, it was really a matter of understanding what science actually says, what peer-reviewed papers actually say. Uh, and once I began reading peer-reviewed papers as opposed to internet gossip columns, I began to realize how solid and how extensive the science was. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I said, well, I think I've been misled here. Mm -hmm. Because it's very clear that GMO uh, technology is very safe, improves yield, improves safety, and is uh, uses you know, less insecticides. It's basically a very good technology. Mm -hmm. So, for that reason, I 
push my view. Yeah, and we will get into this uh, later in the in the uh, interview into the whole the safety side of GMOs. But sure. um, before we get too deep into the questions, um, like we like I said in my first interview, I think this is this is a way to kind of put viewers' minds at ease a little bit and and throw a devil's advocate question at you, Doctor Cooper, and and ask you. And just confirm that you have no conflicts of in interest, no industry ties with Monsanto paying you money under the table. Uh, and so none of your answers are going to be influenced by any industry ties. Is that correct? No, that's absolutely true. I'm a retired scientist uh, who got interested in writing about it. Basically, I'm a writer. There you go. And the only ma money I make is if people read my columns. I get paid by the view. Gotcha. And, okay. you know, anything I want to write about is fair. I could write positive or negative or anything else I want to write. Very good, very good. And I will put a link in the description down below to your many articles on the examiner. Uh, and along the same lines, one more devil's advocate question is, I can see it now. Um, I post something, this title is something new with GMOs. Someone clicks on it, a troll clicks on it, and comments on the movie and says, you, it says, Ian Kramer, you interviewed the most biased, unqualified Monsanto shill scientist on the topic of food safety. Yeah, I met that guy. You should, yeah, you <laughs> should be ashamed of yourself. In your own words, Dr. Cooper, what makes you an authority to speak about this, this complex topic of GMOs and food safety? Well, I do have a PhD in chemistry, and in the process of acquiring the PhD, and in a lot of times thereafter, I had occasion to write and publish technical articles in peer-reviewed journals. And you soon realize, once you get into this, how really hard it is mm -hmm. to write articles and get them published. It's not something where you, you dash it off overnight and the next day it's in print. It, the review process can be quite brutal. Uh, usually they recruit three or four or five experts who are not members of the journal and who are usually not your friends, certainly not my friends, right. to review the article as fairly as they can because they have expertise in whatever they write about. Uh, then usually there's some negotiation back and forth. At first they may uh, say, here's a whole list of problems the referees found with your paper. Please respond to them as many as you can. Then we go back and forth. And I say, well, okay, I can make that clearer. I can, I can respond to that. But I disagree with you here, and that here's why I think the referee is mistaken. Mm -hmm. And you go back and forth like that until everybody's satisfied. Sure, sure. And that means the papers that are actually get out into from scientific journals, they're pretty credible. Right. They go through an awful lot of cleaning up, and uh, there's this not too. Certainly, there are always some bad papers to get out, but there's not many. Sure, sure. The majority, the vast, vast majority of the papers in the reputable journals, you say, are are, are in those journals for a reason, because they're good papers. That's right. Uh, and, oh, I lost my train of thought now. Um, okay, let's... So you ask why I'm qualified. Yeah, yeah, Primarily yeah, yeah. because I understand how science works. Right. I understand and, how, how publishing works. I understand how research is done. Yeah. I understand yeah. that there's a lot of dirty work that goes to before you finally end up writing the paper. Yeah. And I sort of know just from my years in the lab mm -hmm. how much work that really is. And if you were to put a number on the, the number of years of experience you have at reading and deciphering and perhaps even writing peer-reviewed scientific papers, how many years would that be? Oh, 30 or 40 years, I would think. Okay, that's good. That's more than me, so good for you. I, I went through, I have... Uh, one experience of going through the peer review process when I was in graduate school writing my thesis and mm -hmm. it was really long and and it was the back and forth and it was frustrating and you're right I think um, a lot of people can't do it so and and there's a very stringent process I agree with you there um, can you define for us uh, getting into this conversation about GMOs define what a GMO is for us well, in the simplest sense, it's basically a more efficient way of plant breeding. If you take, uh, we go back and look at Norman Borlaug's work in developing the corn that saved Mexico and the corn that saved India, he did thousands and thousands of crosses between various varieties of corn 
And once he had the new plant, usually back cross it with the parents to make a stronger and more reliable um, plant. And every time we do that, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of genes are exchanged. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what you had when they got all done, they have, uh, but it took many years, on much nicer plants. Mm -hmm. But supposing you know exactly what you want to do, you want to have a plant that has one property, one trait that it doesn't have. If I could just take a little bit of DNA and put it in that plant mm -hmm. so that it would have that property, it would be very much more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the most, the two, the first two things that were developed is a uh, weed killer resistant variety. Um, Roundup ready corn and soy were developed early on, and shortly thereafter, the idea of putting BT or Bacillus thuringiensis generating genes into corn so they would kill Lepidoptera, caterpillars, corn vine borers, corn root borers. Mm -hmm. And if you could do that, then you're going to get a better crop. It's right. going to be more resistant to insects and less insecticide is used. So, so the example you gave at the beginning of this answer, this that gentleman who went through dozens and dozens of hybridizations, that, that, that wasn't exactly... Uh, he wasn't making a GMO. He was making more of a hybrid. He was, he, he was just he was just crossbreeding plants. Right. So uh, so people do a lot of crossbreeding these days. But the difference between crossbreeding and GMOs is your it's 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 more precise, and you're looking inside the DNA in a GMO, and you're picking stuff out and putting putting it in. Is that right? That's right. You're you're taking a gene from somewhere else and inserting it in your plant. The okay, gene okay. might come from some. Re closely related species, mm -hmm. or it might come from some some distant species. But you know, genes are genes. Right. They're, they're not the idea of something terrible being happening is ridiculous because we share. Oh, I don't know. Fifty percent of our genes with a banana. Ninety percent of our genes with a fish. Right. They, if the fish, if the gene isn't common, it's really close, and right. so it's not a big problem. Right. Um, and so my next question was, is there any truth to scientists inserting, I, I read this on, on, a, on some um, website, on some, some blog article probably, about inserting the, the um, genetic material of one species, let's say a fish, into a tomato to give it certain traits. Is that heard of or is that nonsense? Yeah, the experiment failed. Yeah. Uh, there actually was an attempt to do that. Uh, and the idea was to make uh, more freeze-resistant tomatoes because fish have some freeze-resistant genes. Okay. It didn't work. Okay. So, yeah, there is no such product. Okay. It never came out of the lab because it didn't work. Gotcha. So there was truth to that, but it never materialized. Okay. That's right. Why are GMOs even developed in the first place? What purpose do they serve to mankind, to humanity? They provide a more effective way of controlling insects and more and can provide um, better more nutritious plants and ones which have higher yields mm -hmm. they're basically these are advantages to the farmer and to the consumer mm -hmm. and it's the only way that we see that we can continue to feel to feed an ever-growing world population and my next question was, let's let's talk about some examples of some GMOs that are in production right now and how those are helping the human race. Well, I can think of a handful. that, that There aren't that many. That, yeah. I mean, the ones that are the most common, of course, would be the corn that we just talked about, which has both BT traits and uh, Roundup-resistant traits. And that's also true of soybeans and alfalfa. But probably the ones that are really interesting are ones that weren't developed by the big seed companies but were developed for specific persons. For example, there was a fungus that was threatening papaya plants in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And an independent scientist uh, came up with an idea of inserting a gene to make the papaya more fungus resistant. That's called the rainbow papaya. Mm -hmm. And it's tremendously successful. It really saved the crop in Hawaii. The other one you really want to think about is the um, 
golden rice. Mm -hmm. Golden rice was, again, this was developed by a couple of professors, although they eventually, in their second generation, got some help with from Syngenta because they were having trouble getting the amount of vitamin A as large as it should be. The idea would be that a lot of people in various poor areas, particularly in Africa, uh, don't get enough vitamin A. Mm -hmm. It's particularly bad for children. If they don't get that vitamin A, they may go blind, they may die. It's mm -hmm. very serious. Mm -hmm. So being able to provide vitamin A in the rice as part of their normal diet would be a great idea. That rice exists, although there's a huge political controversy about it, which has nothing to do with its safety, which has been established years ago. Greenpeace seems to be really opposed to it for what seems to be somewhere between political and, I hate to say religious reasons, but emotional reasons. Sure, sure. So uh, a critic of GMOs, and let's say this golden rice or these, these rainbow papaya, a critic might say, Dr. Cooper, why mess with nature? Just let nature take its course. This corn is natural. These these uh, caterpillars are natural. So what if the caterpillars uh, kill the corn? Let nature take its course, and we'll find something else to, to grow. Yeah, we could starve. Yeah. I mean, the, these are really, really important social problems that we're solving. It's not just a matter of, is it a nicer looking plant? Mm -hmm. It provides something that people truly, truly need. Uh, and if you were to say, why don't we try to breed it by hand? Mm -hmm. Well, we could try, yeah. but it might take many, many years, and it might not work. The the it took it was a good ten years before they really had a version of golden rice that had enough vitamin A into it that it could be fed to people. And then they simply ran into what I call a uh, political bottleneck. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And something I read interestingly too is is the rainbow papaya crop. Not only, <coughs> excuse me. Not only is it helping feed people, but it's also, if humans didn't intervene with this GMO crop, was it a, a you said a fungus that was killing the papaya? I believe so. I'd have to look it up, but I think so. Yeah. <coughs> that this. So if if they didn't intervene, this fungus would have wiped out the rainbow papaya, which is a huge part of the local economy in that part of Hawaii. Is that right? That's right. Well, it would have run, wiped out the non-rainbow papaya. Rainbow right. is actually the name of the one. That, that is protected from it. Uh, and as it turns out, a little more than half of the uh, papaya grown in Hawaii have this protective gene inserted. Mm -hmm. But because they do, it actually protects the ones nearby as well. Oh, nice. Very but good. It's a really cool idea. Yeah. Can you talk about the process by which a scientist develops a GMO tomato and how that tomato, let's say, and, and again, we're using a tomato as just uh, for semantics for an arbitrary fruit or vegetable. Well, there was one. Okay. So, and, and how that fruit or vegetable uh, uh, ends up on our shelves in regards to sort of government regulation, government testing, research, and sort of the safety of that fruit or vegetable. Well, first of all, they have to figure out what gene might help. And then they have to find a way to insert that gene in the plant. An awful lot of these are done using um, <clears throat> agrobacterium, which is a sort of a uh, plant fungus that you would find. For example, if you see the swellings on the sides of uh, oak trees, mm -hmm. they're called oak galls. That is caused by agrobacterium inserting itself and infecting the oak tree. But that whole thing is very, very clever. You can take what amounts to a little ring of DNA, which they call a plasmid, insert maybe just another little piece of additional DNA into it. You can get it to insert that DNA into the plant you're interested in mm -hmm. and slowly grow some from that. Mm -hmm. uh, so once you have done that, well, you don't put it out on the field. You, you don't put it out on the dinner table. Right. It goes through 10 or 11 years of testing um, not only do you have to grow a bunch of them and try them yourself and test and make sure that, in fact, the properties that you were trying to develop are actually there, you have to convince the FDA of that. And what happens is the FDA will, you give them a list of what you've done, you tell them what it does, and they say, well, here are all the additional tests we're going to require of you. This, this has takes typically 10 or 11 years to get a new 
GMO plant to the marketplace and many, many millions of dollars, probably hundreds of millions of dollars. And part of that is sort of regulatory overkill now that we know how safe GMOs really are, but there was a time at which I suppose we didn't know that, and that's why this re regulatory framework is so substantial. Mm -hmm. At any rate, what happens then is these are grown, they're distributed, uh, the seeds are grown in sufficient quantities they can be sold. And then there's a couple of models. Well, how do we make our money back on this? You know, we just spent $100 million developing this plant. I can't just, you know, sell the seeds and hope that everything will be all right because they'll just replant them. Right. So there's a couple of methods that could have been used. And the one that came, that was finally developed was simply you sign a license agreement that you won't replant the seeds. You'll buy new ones each year. Mm -hmm. This turns out to be not such a bad deal because if you buy them, you know they're clean, you know they're not infected, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that they haven't crossed with something in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a really good deal for farmers, but it means you're paying a little more for these seeds than if you save them yourself, sure. which has significant mm -hmm. expenses, but not as many. Sure. On the other hand, you're getting a way better crop by doing that. Sure. And so I just want to clarify a few things. Uh, one is one of my um, passions is personal health and nutrition, and I work in a Division three university. And mm -hmm. what, what we tell athletes all the time is that there's quite a few athletes who take these supplements that uh, aren't necessarily regulated by agencies like the FDA. But what, what you just said is that every GMO crop that makes it to the shelves or that, that we... In, that we could potentially eat, it has to be regulated by the FDA. Yes. And in fact, one thing I probably ought to mention is, well, what about allergies? Mm -hmm. we, we make these new plants. How do we know they aren't causing, couldn't cause some terrible allergy? Sure. Well, one way we know is we actually sequence the DNA of those plants and look for any sequence which matches any of the allergy allergens in the DNA database of allergens that is maintained by the FDA. If there's anything close, it probably never makes it to market. Right, right. Uh, that's interesting. And what also struck me as interesting, it's it, it sounds as though it's very similar. The process of, let's say, for uh, argument's sake, a Monsanto-like company going to the FDA and saying, we have this new variety of corn, and, and it's, it, it's a GMO, Here's the testing. What you said, it sounds like the, the back and forth between the Monsanto-like companies and the, and the FDA sounds a lot like the back and forth that happens between scientists and, and these reputable journals where it's, there's a back and forth to try to correct these studies and there's back and forth between the, the biotech companies and the FDA, right? Many, many times? There is some similarity there. Yeah, yeah. Um, all, in, all in an effort to make sure that this product is safe. That's right. Okay. Um, can you paint us a picture of what the quality and the quantity of literature looks like in regards to biotechnology, GMOs, and, and let's say organics? Does the body of evidence, uh, you know, is it overwhelmingly on the side of GMOs are safe? Is it kind of in the middle? And what quantity of research is out there? Okay, uh, I'll uh, give you. What, what, there are just simply tens of thousands of papers that are have been published in the last or ten or twenty years, and I'm not aware of any reputable papers which actually find any harm mm -hmm. in GMOs. That doesn't mean there aren't a few sure. outliers, which are usually easily debunked, but there are, let me I'm talking about a handful, dozens, sure. but there are tens of thousands of papers. One of the very interesting pieces of work was an Italian research group led by a professor named uh, Alessandro um, Nicolia uh, took upon himself to look at all of the studies in the last 10 years. I think this was like uh, 2002 through 2012, approximately that and they looked at every study of the safety of GMO uh, products of any kind. And then 
they they came up with 1,783 papers, and they all showed that there was no more harm caused by GMOs than was caused than was caused by conventional crops. Right. That's one of the major studies. The other one, which is simply overwhelming, is a paper by uh, Allison Van Inenam at um, UC Davis and a couple of her students that looked at the records over the last uh, 29 years of animal feeding, comparing those animals fed GMOs with those animals not fed GMO feed to see if there were any distinguishable differences. And there were not. Mm -hmm. There were none at all. And in fact, should this study amounted to over a billion animals. Yeah. But this is pretty convincing evidence. Mm -hmm. And so with these, these two papers you just cited, it sounds like, and, and I, I encourage my students that I teach to look for meta-analyses. These two papers, were they were meta-analyses. Well, certainly of, Nicolia was. Yeah. The Van Eenenen paper is, is an analysis of basically of USDA records and, and other records that were available on animal feeding that were well-kept and, and reliable. Right. And so I, I just want to, with the next question, is sort of more of a confirmation, uh, clarification. So with so much hype around GMOs and them being dangerous, I, 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 I would assume that it wouldn't be hard to find, let's say, several dozen uh, of these peer-reviewed studies linking them to some poor health or certain disorder within humans. But from what you just said, there may be a few lying around in some non-reputable papers, but there really aren't a whole lot. There, are, well, I'm not aware of them, and I, I tend to read some every day and look at well, who wrote them? Yeah. What's the credibility of the journal? Mm -hmm. A lot of these things show up in journals that we would call predatory journals, which will simply print anything that you, if you pay them. Yeah. Uh, they're not really peer-reviewed, yeah. and that's where a lot of these really odd papers show up in terms of papers that are reliable from and from people who have a, a decent publication track record they're very few yeah um, and also you I think you mentioned in your book that there are, the, there are these journals where essentially you just pay a fee and they'll publish it kind of no That's questions, right. no questions asked it appears so yeah I mean there, there have been some comic experiments where some people uh, publish sent in Absolute nonsense. Maybe with just paragraphs from seven different papers in right. different fields, and and submitted it. And the journal said, "Oh yeah, you'll pay twelve hundred dollars. We'll be happy to publish that next week." Right. And there's one even worse, uh, where someone took the phrase "Get me off your effing mailing list" <laughs> it five hundred times. Yeah, yeah. And they, offered, they agreed to publish it. Right. I think I've heard that story before. So that's. <sighs> so you can't really trust journals yeah. that are gullible very it, far. It is scary. And then those articles from those journals end up in people's blog posts. And then it, it, it spreads like wildfire, unfortunately. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, you have to recognize the Internet is only a research tool if you know how to filter out the, the chaff. Sure, sure. Uh, you believe, Dr. Cooper, that, geo, that GMOs and biotechnology crops are in no way harmful why do people think that GMOs are so harmful? What makes them so scared? I think it's a little hard to understand. I, th I think that people do this because they... We spent, what, 15, 20 minutes here explaining it, and you have to talk to somebody who chops at Whole Foods and, and is just interested in you know, pretty-looking vegetables sure. and their word. Mm -hmm. It's really hard once they've made up their mind to get them to understand that they could be mistaken. Sure. It's hard to explain. And people don't usually want to change their preconceived notions or study a little bit of science. And of course, it's the problem of science vocabulary. You have to know a little science, not a lot, in order to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and well, that's the hope of this interview, is that hopefully this gets around to a few people. And, and you know, maybe now is the time for me to say to, to someone who may be watching this who is skeptical on GMOs, I'm not trying to push you in that direction. I'm simply, here's the information and, and, and use this to make up your own mind about GMOs in that there's other information out there saying that 
the majority of information out there is saying that GMOs really aren't aren't harmful. So, um, you know, you can leave. another really really interesting study was published yeah. by the European Food Safety Association. It was funded by the EU, which is a political entity, is probably anti-GMO, but they funded this for a ten-year study, and there were a hundred and so different research groups that carried out experiments and did their and did literature reviews come out with nearly 500 papers mm -hmm. which have been published as a book which you can download and read for yourself but you only have to read the page two to see the overall conclusion is they pose no harm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's a huge organization that yeah. is that has come to the consensus of there that's really there really is no harm um, when we enter the produce department in a grocery store and we see celery and broccoli and all kinds of fruits and vegetables, are there any in, in the Whole Foods like type roast grocery stores that are GMO? There aren't that many off-the-shelf plants that would be GMO. <clears throat> Sweet corn, maybe. Okay. And most of the corn that's grown as GMO plants is field corn, which goes into uh, production for example, it goes into corn ethanol and corn syrup and so forth. Okay. Uh, in addition to uh, sweet corn, you would there is some summer squash, which is GMO. I don't know how much, mm -hmm. but you know the seeds are available. You can buy them, assuming you want to buy a whole bag, sure. which you know several hundred dollars. They're available. Sure. Uh, you just have to sign the license agreement. Uh, and there are also, of course. It, this this is silly, but you can go. Sugar is grown is produced either from sugar cane or sugar beets. Most sugar beets grown in the U.S. are uh, Roundup ready, and therefore the plants have our GMO, or at least they appear to be. But bear in mind, sugar is a single molecule, and sugar is sugar is sugar. It doesn't matter where it comes from. But people that don't understand that it's, there's a single molecule involved are sure that they're somehow different and one of them is bad, mm -hmm. which is simple. Right. I'm, uh, I'm big on uh, shopping. I kind of peruse the organic the organic or the health food section quite often in grocery stores. I've never seen beet sugar sold. Have you ever seen it? In, like, oh, sure. Uh, you've seen it sold? Yeah, it's quite a bit. If you, if you actually pick up the bag and look. I mean, it just says sugar because it is sugar. Yeah. But you can look on the bag and it'll tell you where it came from. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and uh, if it came from uh, cane, it'll say cane sugar somewhere. Uh, it may say beet sugar, or it may say where it's grown. And uh, beet sugar is grown in uh, the northern tier of the U.S. in Canada, okay. whereas you know, you know you wouldn't get uh, cane, sugar cane then. Yeah. Should foods be labeled if they contain GMO products? Well, this is actually sort of more of a philosophical sure. point, but it is also an economic point. The whole impetus behind labeling GM products has really comes from the Organic Consumer Association, which have a political agenda. <clears throat> they want you, they want all GM products labeled because people will find that the mark of Cain will avoid it and will buy organic foods, which are considerably more profitable because the markup is way higher. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, you have to think about what it would cost to actually label uh, GM foods. If you had to maintain, a, a, as a farmer or as a um, a miller, duplicate supply chains that wouldn't con contaminate at separate silos uh, and so forth, separate tractors, whatever it takes, it could double the cost of producing food, which would be a terrible expense. Sure. Now, some people argue that that's not really true. It's just the price of printing a new label. And that is not true. What they really want you is to print GMO-free on everything and stop growing these things, which they feel <clears throat> are in somehow dangerous. But what they really are is threatening the organic market. The Organic Consumers Association has spent well over a billion dollars fighting GMOs and, and insisting on GMO labeling. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, they fund a number of organizations with similar names like U.S. Right to Know and Just Label It and so forth. They all have the same agenda. Gotcha. Um, I want to switch gears for just a second, and then we're going to go back to a few other last questions about GMOs. 
I want to switch gears and just speak about Monsanto for a second and, and these biotech companies in general. Uh, well, you gave me a funny answer on the first interview we did. Is why I'll see do, if I can remember all it. All right. Why do people hate Monsanto so much? Well, because Syngenta is harder to pronounce. There you go. Uh, really. Uh, there are five major biotech companies. Monsanto is one of them. It's not the biggest. Syngenta is bigger. But many of the initial patents were developed at Monsanto. Not all. Syngenta developed some of them. Uh, and they cross license between them. In any rate, they don't like Monsanto, number one, because they think that having to pay or sign a license for Monsanto seeds is somehow evil. But in fact, seeds have been patented since the 1930s, sure. and you're not supposed to replant them, whether you're required to sign a license or not. That are Those are the facts. A trouble, the difference between you know a chrysanthemum and many, many acres of corn would make it more likely you're going to sign a license to grow corn. Sure. The uh, other thing is that Monsanto sues people who violate that license. People think, oh, that's terrible. Well, they've done it very few times, 147 over the last 10 years or so. And in every case, they did it because people replanted saved seed or seed that they somehow obtained without paying for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they went, they've won all those cases. It's interesting to note that if they don't go to court and they settle out of court, Monsanto donates the entire proceeds to charity. Gotcha. That's well. That's nice of them. That's certainly nice of them. Uh, so I'm thinking, if if I were a farmer and let's say I didn't want to buy Monsanto's Roundup Ready seed, uh, one argument from the other side might be, well, you know, these farmers' hands are tied because the only seed they can buy is Monsanto. Roundup well, Ready Corn. There's five companies that are selling. Uh, and you can buy anything you want. You can buy a different thing next year. You're not tied by contract mm -hmm. into buying the same thing every year. Yeah. Can you can you still buy can you still buy non GMO corn? Of course. Absolutely. Okay. Tons of it. Okay. And it's a matter of what is suitable for your farm. And you there are lots of good reasons for either. Gotcha. In Chapter 13 of your book, you're, t you're speaking about organic foods. You come right out and say, quote, we can ignore the pesticide residue as a health issue. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on this topic? Yeah, this is a really cool experiment that was done by Bruce Ames in the uh, late 1990s. He's a professor at uh, Berkeley, I believe. Uh, and he published in, in the Proceedings of the National Academy. The paper is easily found and not hard to read. What he did was he recognized that most vegetable crops generate their own protections. They make their own insecticides. And these insecticides are, are not all that different from the ones that manufacturers would like to sell you because they know what's there too, and they're simply mimicking it and, use, and uh, making it available. And so these insecticides are, could be carcinogenic, could be toxic, but they're, of course, in very small quantities, or we wouldn't be eating the plants. Sure. What's interesting is he analyzed the quantities of these and then looked at the amount of pesticide residue come from actually from spraying the plants. Mm -hmm. And he found that the, the insecticides generated by the plants were 10,000 times as, as concentrated as the traces of pesticide residue, which means it doesn't matter much which pesticide farmers use. It's completely overwhelmed with what the plants are making anyhow. Right, right. Um, so, uh, you know, in your book, you basically say, in regards to organic blueberries, organic this, organic that, it's not worth it to eat organic, in your opinion. Well, organic is a marketing label. Uh, and it was developed, uh, when it was developed originally, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture at the time said, make no mistake, this is a marketing label. There's no guarantee of health or nutrition. It is simply a marketing label for a particular set of agricultural techniques. Uh, and the thing that, that the organic industry has tried to get you to believe 
is that organic farmers do not spray their crops. Well, they do. Yeah. And they 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 may use the, they, there are some there's a quite a huge list of things they're allowed to use yeah. and how much of them they use will depend on the insect pressure and that would depend exactly on where you're raising your crops but they're allowed to use quite a number of things and they're not all nice right some of them are pretty nasty and therefore uh, the fiction the organic crops have not been sprayed is is the organic industry's big lie it's just not true yeah yeah and 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 along the same line something i see quite often in my um whole foods plant-based you know vegan circles is that buying organic blueberries or whatever the fruit and vegetable is the the the, it's healthier than buying non-organic you get more nutrients you get more this or that from the organic well there's been a couple that's been studied of course yeah uh and there was a paper, I'd have to pull up my book and look it up exactly where it was now, but it was done probably at Davis, where they analyzed the nutrients in both organic and uh, conventional crops, and they found them pretty much equivalent. There were a few nutrients that were slightly higher and a few that were slightly lower, but they were effectively the same. Uh, that paper um, was... Widely distributed. Uh, a couple of years later, another group in England repeated that work, and by adding in some much less credible papers, were able to skew their analysis and come up with a con- uh, with a con- the opposite conclusion. But that paper has not been well received because it was pretty obvious what they did. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Uh, people people fear GMOs, chemicals, and foods pesticides, herbicides, artificial sweeteners. In, in my view, all these fears are related to their desire to stay healthy and to, to keep their family healthy. From your book, in summary, you know, we don't have to fear these things, essentially. We don't have to fear these things. What sh- if, if we're not going to fear those things, what should we be concerned about? What should we devote time and energy to to make sure that we stay healthy. Well, I mean, you have better answers for that than I do because that's closer to your field than mine. But staying healthy means eating a healthy diet, uh, avoiding excess fats and sugars, eating more fruits and vegetables, more fiber, and so forth. Those sure. are standard, really good ideas. But I wanted to bring up one interesting thing, though. People fear chemicals because they are afraid they don't know what they are because they pronounce them. Right. This, this is what Food Bay uh, likes to tell you. <laughs> if you have the pronunciation skills of a third grader. But if you didn't skip phonics class, you can probably pronounce any of those and maybe you'll realize there's nothing much to fear there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm i familiar. I actually made a movie a, a, quite a while ago on, on Food Babe and uh, I think I, I, I saw a few citations I think in your book or a few uh, mentions of food babe in your book and I'm assuming you're not really a fan no because she has no scientific training at all and has made no attempt to learn any because her business model is to scare people into buying products that she endorses and which she gets right right yeah I think I checked out her she has uh, uh, she sells products through Amazon, through her website, I believe. So, well, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you think I can get her for an interview? You can try. I mean, she certainly is um, very much uh, made herself a public figure. Yeah. The only question is whether she wants to talk to a skeptic. Sure. Well, we'll try. Maybe I'll try. Uh, some devil's advocate questions. A few more to, to, to summarize, to round up this interview. Some crops are made to be Roundup ready, like you said. Um, like corn, you said, I think, and soy as well. And you explained what this means. Someone commented on, on a post or thread, and I thought this was an interesting comment. They said that, oh, since these crops, since this corn is Roundup ready, this means that farmers have the ability or uh, they can just bathe their their crops indiscriminately with Roundup because, hey, the corn's not going to die, and the more Roundup... Well, the- so we don't know that. 
right. we know that it we, we know that corn is resistant to Roundup in the normal quantities farmers would use. But bear in mind, herbicides are expensive. Mm -hmm. Here's the amount that you would normally use to cover an acre of fee of field. Mm -hmm. Twelve ounces. Yeah. That's not exactly spraying it indiscriminately. Sure. And you wouldn't want to do it a lot more than that because it's expensive. That's enough to kill the weeds. Mm -hmm. And this is usually applied early on after the corn or whatever has come up. And then you spray it because the weeds come up about the same time mm -hmm. and you can kill them. You don't keep on spraying it and you don't spray a lot because it would be a foolish waste of money. And you, you mentioned in your book that, uh, you're going to have to explain this better than me, that, that the Roundup doesn't stick around, that it, it, it biodegrades. It it, and furthermore, it's applied before the food part is even generated. Okay. And so it's not really going to be in any significant amount on the food you actually eat. Okay, okay. A lot of people have written somehow that uh, Roundup is inside the plant and it's made, and that's what the genes do. No, they, that, that's absolutely silly. What happens is... There is a gene in corn that is Roundup ready that resists Roundup. Gotcha. And I go into that, but it doesn't really matter so much as there's no poison in the plant. Right, right. There's no actual Roundup being produced in the plant itself. It has a resistance to the spray that the farmer sprays on the crops. I mean, that, that makes sense to me. It makes sense. Uh, I did a quick 10-second Google search when I was coming up with these questions and found a number 26 as the number of countries that have either banned or limited GMO crops in some way. If, if what you say in that GMO crops are not harmful, that these huge organizations have, have looked at the research and said there's, there's no risk, why have these countries, these huge entities, taken this stand against GMOs? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with the United States Congress, mm -hmm. which is not very popular right now because they haven't been terribly productive. But Congress is easily swayed to take positions that are not necessarily sensible. And in fact, banning GMO crops, all they are really saying in these countries is, we're going to restrict planting of GMO seeds. There's very few countries that restrict the import of GMO feed, GMO corn, GMO soy, GMO uh, alfalfa, and so forth. These are readily imported in nearly all these countries. Uh, and so it's a bit of a uh, misnomer to say they've banned GMOs. They've banned the planting of them in, I don't know what that number is. It may not be quite as large sure. as it's in, in that size some number of countries, but if you look at the uh, an overall map of how many countries where GMOs has grown, in terms of acreage, most of the countries have not banned it in any significant way. Uh, there are, you know, groups of people who are, whose legislatures have been persuaded by the local warriors. Mm. So it sounds highly political. It's it's not it really. Political. It's not. So if, if scientists ran those countries, none of them would ban GMOs. Right, but do you really <laughs> want scientists to run countries? Well, I don't know. I guess not. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yes, it's true that there's an awful lot of countries that could deal need science advice mm -hmm. that more than they get. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that about rounds up rounds out my questions. I mean, the last one I have is if someone watches this and says, you know what, I learned a little bit, I want to get away from uh, educating myself through blogs, and I want to look at some credible sources that have perhaps summaries of the body of research on whatever topic it may be, can you recommend some websites that people can go to for sort of rock-solid peer-reviewed research on whatever topic it may be? Well, let's just stick to biotechnology no, I'm because sorry. I can let's, give you some there. Let's do uh, it. Obviously, academicsreviewed.org uh, okay. is a good site, and they particularly have uh, shot down everything that Jeffrey Smith has said very effectively. Uh, 
There's also biofortified.org, uh, which is started by originally by a group of postdocs at the University of Wisconsin, and it's maintained by some of them and some of their graduates. And it's a good source of good papers and a place where you can ask questions. There's also a site called GMO Answers where you can ask questions. You can even answer some yourself. Mm -hmm. Some of the answers are written by uh, Monsanto. In mm -hmm. fact, I think Monsanto subsidizes that site. But the science is still solid. Sure. Uh, there's a good Facebook group called GMO LOL, mm -hmm. which I love because people do tend to make a lot of jokes there about foolishness that they see. Mm -hmm. But there are so many good scientists and good farmers that participate in it that you can get an answer to almost anything there any day you want. And I will say that since our first try at this interview, I liked that uh, GMO LOL page, and I got to say it's very active. There's a oh, lot. Of, there's a lot of posts. There's also the Genetic Literacy Project. Okay. And that one is very good too. Do you think? Now I didn't write this down, but you know, with my experience with that GMO LOL page, do you think that people making fun of and poking fun at GMOs and perhaps people who believe that GMOs are harmful is really the best way to educate? Or is, is their message getting through to skeptics of GMOs? The GMO LOL side is clearly for people who believe in science and like to make fun of people who don't. Right. But those people know the science and you can just ask questions there. Yeah. And the question about the GMO tomato comes up every couple of weeks. And so, yeah, you know, that failed. Um, there aren't any GMO tomatoes. There was one that was made, and that was made by, that was the flavor saver tomato. It was made by Calgene, and it really worked. They inhibited the gene that caused tomatoes to soften. Mm -hmm. And so the flavor remained longer, and you could pick them later, but it was too expensive. Mm -hmm. And so it was really withdrawn because they couldn't do it effective, cost effectively. What's the best way, last question here, is, is this all the people who are skeptics, what do you think is the best way to sort of persuade them, change their mind, and have them see the evidence? Well, there's so many good books you could read, even without flogging my own. You mm -hmm. can read Mendel in the Kitchen by Pam Ronald, a really wonderful book, easily read. Mm -hmm. It takes you through a lot of this material. Uh, and uh, there's another book... Uh, excuse me, I'm going blank, but I'll send it to you. You can okay. put it on the list. Sure. Uh, that, uh, you know, those, those are places you can start. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, of course, the thing to do is to ask questions. Sure. There's lots of people ask questions. Be, be, I'm on Facebook. You can ask me if you yeah. want. Be Stay curious is what I like to say. Stay, Absolutely. stay curious. Um, Dr. Cooper, last word. What, what, what do you have to say? I want to give you the last word. I've learned an awful lot in the last five years by digging in what the real science is. And bear in mind, I am not a biologist. I'm a chemist. I do know how research works, but I didn't know an awful lot about uh, biology when I started. I know a lot more now. And I'm really fascinated by what I learned. And you will be too. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's great. Stay curious. Read the research. Dr. Cooper, Dr. James Cooper, thank you very much for this interview. His book is Food Myths Debunked. That I will put a link to oh, that. I'll wave it. I'll wave it for you. Okay. Great. Terrific. There it uh, is. I will post a link to that down in the description. Dr. Cooper, thank you so much for your time again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye.